Uh, I feel like I don't need this mic, but maybe I'll try it. Uh, today is an asthmatic day for me. I'm sorry. I apologize for the voice. Um, my dachshund decided to sleep on top of me last night. That's the result. Uh, so we are we are really pleased today to have a unique uh, show in our series, and that is a combination of opening, art opening, and reading. And the reason we can do that is this wonderful book right here called In the Museum of My Daughter's Mind, which is a collaboration between Annalie Hafer and Marjorie Maddox, who are daughter and mother. And um, so I'm going to say a little bit about each of them using my crib notes. <laughs> Uh, I'll start with Anna. Anna's a studio artist uh, who lives in the Philadelphia area. She graduated from Roberts Wesleyan in Rochester, and uh, her art includes studio exhibitions at the Davison Art Gallery, Rochester Contemporary Art Center, as well as published images and broadsides in Still Point Arts Quarterly, the Westchester Review, the Penn Review, Pinecone. Uh, the o Open Journal of Arts and Letters and the Ecrastic Review, where I have also published, um, and elsewhere. Her work is heavily influenced by such surrealist painters as Magritte, Ali, Picasso, all of whom strove to build their own realities through small glimpses into, into the, a particularly confusing but utterly unique worldview that dictates its own specific set of instructions. I'm going to leave the rest for you guys to discuss as you, as you do as we go. Um, of Marjorie Maddox, I'll say a few things, too. Uh, she's a professor of English and creative writing at Lock Haven University in Pennsylvania. Uh, she's published 14 collections of poetry. This is so impressive. I'm, I'm, wow. Does it feel like 14? No. No. Okay. It feels like one big book. Okay. Uh, including Transplant, Transport, Transubstantiation, True, False, None of the Above, Local news from someplace else, perpendicular as I, and begin with question, which is the most recent one before this. Right? And that's the winner of the poetry religious category of the International Book Awards. Um, and again, this is her latest collection and uh, a group of ekphrastic poems, so poems that respond to Anneli's paintings. And without saying any more, I will bring up Marjorie. Yeah. So we're going to do, can you hear me all right? Yes. Okay, okay we're going to thank you first for being here and being such a friendly crowd. I can't say familiar. Well, we, we have one person actually that we ran into, the, uh, our friend um, from Williamsport, Cindy. So one familiar face, but all friendly faces. Um, so we wanted to talk about this collaboration, and we're going to make it a little bit of a conversation between us um, so that I can read some of the poems of the artwork that you see on the walls. And Anneli can also give her perspective on her process and talk a little bit about that. So um, this book had kind of two beginnings in, in a way. One beginning was in 2018 where... Um, I had just had a heart catheterization, which everything turned out okay, but I was kind of exhausted. And Anneli had come down to visit, and we decided, we had heard about um, this exhibit at the Visual Arts Museum in Baltimore. And I'll show you some images of paintings there a little bit later to show you why. But um, it's, a, it's a fascinating museum if you haven't been there. And Anneli drove us down through a blinding rainstorm because I was pretty exhausted. And we had a really great time and kind of a bonding experience in some ways, talking about literature, poetry, and art and how they intersect. And um, so that was one beginning. Another beginning was a few years later, I was teaching a poetry workshop class. I was teaching a plastic poetry, writing about art. And I decided kind of on a whim to put up my daughter's website. And the students were fascinated by it. And several of them wrote poems about her work. And I thought, well, gee, I should do that too. Um, so I got kind of on a roll and ended up writing about 18 poems about some of her pieces. So that's the bulk of this book. And then um, 
The other part is a series of poems that I wrote about the American Vision Arts Museum, so several pieces of, of that. And then last year, I also collaborated with a photographer, Karen Elias, and we had a book come out, and so she has a few pieces in here as well. So I'm going to, I know you can't see this super well, but I think it'll give you uh, enough so we can see kind of an outline. Uh, so one of the things that really drew me, besides the fact that she's my daughter, um, to Annalie's work is that she, there's layer after layer after layer in her work. And so I hope that you can, uh, we hope that you can go around and kind of look more closely. But what poet is not going to love that she has words woven throughout the painting? So, um, and I'm always interested in changes of perspective different points of view. And so you'll see it, you know, at first this looks like a library. Of course, I'm going to, you know, I'm intrigued by libraries anyways, and a chessboard and this armchair. But then you see that it's on top of a building. And there's another uh, chair here. And um, she has words woven this way. Um, what are some of the other, other words here? Uh, um, I'm, well, I'm going to let her talk a little bit about the painting. You know, I, I had to think about, okay, is this splotch? Is that a mistake or is that there on purpose? So I was intrigued by all these questions. And why don't you talk a little bit about your process for this particular painting? By the way, I own this painting, so this is in our, our living room. So this was a, a Christmas present uh, for me, um, which I love. So. Okay, so... Um... A little bit about this piece. Um, I'm really interested in chess. Um, I think chess is really interesting because every time you play chess, it's like you're playing a different game. It's never the same game twice. And I think um, the armchair really symbolizes a lot of like thought for me. And so does chess. So this is really about like you know being in your thoughts as well. Um, in a lot of my work, and you'll start to see we talk about this as we go through more paintings, but a lot of the theme in my work is trying to kind of confuse the viewer. Um, I want you to be in an unrecognizable place. So I want you to be in a place where you have no idea where you are. And you might recognize a few things um, that might be familiar to you, but your mind is still like, where am I? What time am I in? What place am I in? Um, so I have this armchair. Um, with a chessboard, but then I also have the same armchair with another chessboard facing the other way. So it's really like, are you sitting in this chair? Maybe somebody else is sitting in the other chair. Maybe you're in both chairs. So I kind of leave, I leave a lot of um, interpretation up to the viewer because I want you all to view the painting in a different way. So this, uh, and here are just some close-ups, and you can see some of the words a little more more clearly and the different perspectives. This way, don't go. And then a lot of arrows throughout her work. And then I'm not going to read this um, poem, but one of the ways that helped me enter uh, the artwork, because I think a drastic work is not summarizing the piece, but it's actually entering into the painting or the sculpture or the music so that you're interacting with it, you're becoming part of it. Um, so I would use her artist statements a lot as a way to, to kind of get into it. Um, after I would write something, I would uh, send it to her and we'd talk a lot about it. So it was a great way to kind of dialogue and find out. And sometimes she'd say, yeah, you got that right. Or, you know, I also was thinking about this particular theme. So I tried to go back and use that in my revision process. Um, I used a lot of fixed forms in this particular book, and so this is a, a form called a pantoum, where the um, two lines in the first stanza are, you can see the second and fourth lines become the first and third line in the next one, and a lot of times I take italicized phrases from her artist statement, and uh, I take statements from um, her artist statement and then italicize them and weave them through. Okay, so this is one of the paintings that captivated us, that made us um, drive down to the American Visionary Art Museum in Baltimore um, because of this work by Margaret Munchlach. So this was part of that nine painting series that I originally wrote 
in 2018. And um, we were very captive. We were both kind of captivated and wanted to see her work in person. And I was particularly drawn to these portraits of her daughter. So that mother-daughter connection came in. But also because when you look more closely, it looks very kind of um, innocent at first. But when you look more closely, this little girl is made up entirely of bees. Oh. And there's another portrait where she that I'll show you in a minute where she's entirely made up of maggots. And there's another portrait where she's made up of butterflies. So I was intrigued by that. So I wanted to read this um, particular poem because I thought it set up a lot of the themes in Annalie's paintings as well. Thank you. At the American Visionary Museum, White Rabbit. Eyes the pale blue gray of cornflowers, the naked girl buzzes with bees, is bees. Nipple, elbows, neck, chest, swarming forehead, insect fingers grasping the starkly white, pink-eyed magician's rabbit of miracles, paired with the good leaf clover sprouting from her dirt blonde bun, crawling with workaholic drones, loyal to scent and perceived innocence. The way my mother's skin tingles with hers, is hers, yours, Tiny stings that cling to the most vulnerable flesh left to love, hovering sweetly, deceptively over the decaying, the dead. And at the time, both of us were um, kind of uh, fighting some health challenges, so that represented a lot of that to me. It kind of got us started in some ways. So here are some of the other pieces. Um, Greg Moore does a lot of stuff with astronomy. He has things hanging in the White House. And all these people, I was just kind of blown away by this, um, graciously allowed us to use the paintings in the book without any charge whatsoever, uh, which was very generous. Here's the little girl who's made out of maggots. Um, Ingo Swan is also known as a psychic. Um, this piece, uh, I have that transplant, transport, transubstantiation book is about my father's unsuccessful heart transplant of the inside of a heart. And this guy is Edgar Allan Poe, and he's made up entirely of peeps, those marshmallow trees that you get at Easter. So that was really interesting. And this is, <laughs> this is the, so you got the black cat and, and everything. And um, this is uh, Karen Elias's photograph, and she's the one I have collaborated with quite a bit as well. Okay, so Annalie and I are going to read this one together because there's some italicized phrases. Um, maybe, maybe stand up. Did you want to say anything about this? Maybe right after. Okay, okay, so bare minimum after the painting by Annalie Hafer. Beneath whitewashed sternum, neck, skull, the fog of face. The residue of dream released to scream or freedom. No comment. Unclothed of skin and woven expectation, bone stacks on bone, exposes the core of caustic commentary. What we see is beneath the said. No comment. Is not the bare, but the unbearable. Here I am. Of society's design on us. I am. Breathing bare. And so I think it helps you hear that kind of in two voices. That painting is right over here. And um, one of the things that intrigued me is if you get very close to it, um, I saw like a screaming skull here, just a faint kind of shadow of that. So you, you might, yeah, you need to go, and I'm going to show it another image. But... Uh, and, um, well, I'll let Amelie talk about the, the painting. Okay, so um, this was a painting I made when I lived in Philadelphia. Um, I lived in an apartment there, and we had a rooftop that I would paint on. And so um, I started working on this painting, and I had originally, like, put a face in and then, done, uh, and then painted the body. But I was really 
I felt like something was really missing. I felt like it was too cliche. I feel like it was a painting that I've seen a million times before and I wanted it to be different. So I was going between maybe I make like, you know, maybe I make her hair different or maybe I'd add another eye or something a little bit um, just to make it more unique. But I eventually just ended up spray painting over the face. And um, I had it, I had left it to dry upstairs on my deck and I had gotten a call from one of my roommates that um, she was freaking out on the phone, calling me when I was at work. It's like, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. I accidentally spilled some paint on your paint. I was like, oh, it's okay. Like, don't worry. I'll take a look at it when I get home. Like, you know, paint can always be fixed. But she felt like really horrible about it. So I guess somebody had like knocked over some paint up there. I'm not really sure how it happened. But anyway, I came home and I took a look at it. And all these, you can't see it as well on this screen, but when you look at the original painting, you'll be able to see it more. There are little brown paint splatters splattered on the top and like through the middle. And I looked at my room and I said, thank you, because I actually like this better now. And so sometimes it's really interesting because, you know, you kind of have this idea in your head about how things will will work out and um, sometimes accidents happen, but sometimes they can be good accidents. So that's something I, I really learned in art that I think is important. So that's why I like sharing the story. Yeah. And here's where I thought I saw the skull. <laughs> um, and I just loved her artist statement too about kind of a commentary about what society expects, particularly of women. So George told me this was his favorite painting, so he'll be interested in the story behind. Do you want to tell the story behind it first? Um, so a little bit of background around me is that um, I did a, I taught a lot of arts programs to kids for a while and um, made a lot of relationships with different families. Um, two of the girls that I still keep in contact with, um, their names are Mary and Tori, and every once in a while have their family over for dinner or something like that. Um, so this was a painting that was hanging up in my stairwell, I believe, and one of the girls um, looked at me, and at that time I had just done like these clouds with um, like cotton balls, and then I didn't have I didn't have this little here and um, she looked at me and she said I really like your paint she must have been like six at the time she said I really like this painting I like the smoke and I thought that was so interesting because to me I had made it like clouds so um, I really like hearing different people's inputs especially children because they come up with things that sometimes you might not think of. So I, I took that and I was like, I kept looking at it and I was like, you know what? That would be really cool if it could be smoke or clouds. Like what if I made it, you know, maybe you're not sure what it is. So I added this train at the back here. And so, um, so it's kind of like up to you, like, what is it? You know? And I thought that was, you know, that was some inspiration I took from a six year old. You know, how, how cool is that? And now it's like in a book. So, you know, sometimes kids have the best ideas. <laughs> and this also ties in, I think, a lot of your work deals with um, society kind of questioning the legitimacy of choosing to be an artist or a writer. Um, and um, so I love that idea as well. Um, so this is called Illegitimately Trained with the, you know, the pun in there. I love that title of yours. The cotton balls are real and the paint. The questions are real and the light. The small and far away loom as large as the not now but once real yellow, orange, blue sunset or sunrise populated by not clouds but smoke, not puffs but cotton. The cotton balls are real and the lines travel someplace across landscape you've been to in real time or before time or now never mind the bright lines of light shine insight fool the eyes with swirl that obstructs the tracks 
traveled once upon a time to some place not dream, right? At least you'll agree the cotton balls are real and the paint, the questions are real and the light, and someone you and not you opened the view to time moving while you and not you waited on a small painted chair and agreed the cotton balls are real and the paint, the lines line up to something purchased at Rite Aid and Lowe's before the artist pulled out of an open bag, applied pride out of a sealed can, a train, the tracks, a sky, smoke, you, really, come see, the cotton balls are real, and the paint. And then here are some, some close-ups. And it also has words in it, what time is it? So kind of questioning reality throughout. And um, there was also a little chair in there, too. But you have to kind of look closely to find some of these little things. OK. Um, I, also, I love all these paintings. But I also particularly am fond of, of this one. And although Anna Lee um, drew it in um, Philadelphia, right, it, it reminded me, and she did this before COVID, but it reminded me of people corresponding and communicating from their balconies, particularly in New York City. Um, and this is also a pantoum where the lines are repeated in the, the second stanza. Um, so I'll go ahead and read this, and then we can talk about your process on it. Sun on South Street. Small, quiet room, big, busy city. The sun finds us anyway, camaraderie of light and dark isolation. We look out windows at each other. In this way, the sun finds us, brightened by the wave of strangers, as we look out windows at each other, connected by warmth and light. So bright, these lives of strangers. And the outside flowers brought in, connecting us to warmth and light. See how they cheer us. Mornings, we bring our flowers out to balconies, display them for each other. See how this cheers us, camaraderie and light amidst dark isolation. On balconies, we display flowers for each other. In this way, the neighborly sun finds us, camaraderie of light in dark isolation. Small, quiet room, big, busy city. And again, you see that difference in perspective, and that the painting is right here. Yeah, I do. But you can see how, um, so you can probably see much better there. Um, it look at, first, it looks like the, a whole building, and then you look down, and there's a whole other town there. So, kind of similar thing. Yeah, um, perspective is really one of the most important things in my work. Um, it kind of ties into placing you in a different world or a different time. So, I took a lot of inspiration from Dolly and his perspective and how he extends the space really back so far that it, it almost seems like it's going on forever. Um, so this piece was another piece I made in Philadelphia. Um, it was really, I was really thinking about when I was making this, how when you're an artist, sometimes you have to really like isolate yourself in the studio to get things done and to think. And when I was making this painting, I was thinking about how interesting it was that I was in this huge city, but yet I isolated myself, and not in a bad way, in a good way, to get my work done and to think about my process and whatnot. So that's kind of that's kind of what this painting is about. It's a, you can see some of the details here then. And this is this is one that we haven't read a, a lot before. Um, titled "Noise," and I how to explain this. One of the things I was dealing with in this particular poem is I was having this strange um, phenomenon. It's called pentosmia, where you smell things that aren't there. So I would wake up in the middle of the night and. My husband had never smelled any of the things that I smelled. I said, why does that room smell like garlic? 
the house is on fire, I smell smoke. And apparently this can be, I talked with my GP, this can be a sign of strokes, seizures, other things. So they had me go check it out and um, I had, had to check in the EG and everything's taken care of, I'm fine. But I was also very sensitive to, to noise. I've always been sensitive to noise, but I was particularly sensitive to a lot of noise at the time. And this piece was called Noise, so it reminded me of some of those things. And I have to remember this is two two page poem. Uh, noise. My own electrical storm break dancing the sky a skull, riotous rips on the unpredictable. Even before the EEG MC to asymmetrical jerks, my tolerance for sounds tossed out with each dizzying, dizzying jag of note. Each ragged twirl, each syncopation on steroids batters the cerebral cyclone gone haywire into that some vast static of seizure. Sorry. <coughs> per scale of cacophony, tornado and earthquake, firework and fissure, ramps up chaos, axes the faux door, pummels the thin walls, evicts balance from the brain. No predictable melodic drone sliding forward toward home. No quiet, sweet quiet, easing the night into calm. And I'll go back if you want to talk about the painting in general. Um, so this painting, I was thinking about how to put music in a physical form. Um, so I was thinking about like living in a house or living in an apartment and if a band is playing, how would that look if you were an abstract artist? So this like giant orb that you see is like my idea of music, like maybe a band in the street playing and um, these abstracted buildings are receiving the noise or the music. Mm -hmm. Okay, this, this is one also where I was really intrigued by Annalie's um, depiction of different points of view, different decisions, um, how you decide, how you interpret things, I guess. Um, King Street. In, out, up, down, any city, town, wrecked, tacked to the frame of a window with someone, not you, looking out, looking in. What is the point of point of view? The apple on the tree or the counter, the apple of my eye slicing the view into juicy sections while the downtown tilts this way or that and the who who sees it all devours or nibbles between lines that could be sun or paint or poem or street or icicle melting or mind meandering here or there, now or now. So I called this um, painting King Street because I lived in, you know, you'll see like these paintings kind of tell a story of my moves in my life as I, um, as I become an artist. But I was in living in Pottstown in a, a, a one, uh, studio apartment at the time, right after I graduated from college. And um, from my window, you kind of like looked down and you could see like the other apartment buildings. So from like the top half of the painting is like all the, all the outside, like what I saw from, the, from my view out the window. And then the bottom half is like my apartment. So the inside of my apartment. So um, a lot of my work, I'm really interested, like I've said before, like confusing the viewer, but also putting different elements that are interior and also exterior together to get that sort of juxtaposition. Um, so you can see like on the bottom half, I have like a chair, I have a little table, um, maybe tiles on the floor and some bananas and an apple. And then the top half, you're seeing more building, sky, sun. So. And so here are some close-ups where you can see, you know, me playing out the idea of apple, apple of my eye.
in this piece called um, High Top, also kind of intrigued me. It, you know, I don't think paintings to me raise all these questions in my mind that I then try to answer through the poem. Uh, so there's kind of two chairs up there. So it it looks to me like a chessboard. Um, and this also reminded me a little bit, I think this one also has two pages, I need to remember that. Um, also reminded me of some of the, how you process things like grief and um, mourning. Seesaw balance between ground and muted sky. We ride imagination to life. The one without vacant chairs, chessboard absent of the pieces we forgot to move or bring or pick up from the jagged noise. Nine lies below the paint pitch roof, the wind swept air, the sinking sun peering in at other empty tables, empty chairs. What you are saying is the compass needle pole that keeps us whole and here, such precarious stability on this platform island of two minus two. Are we still we in this unseen grief that keeps trying to listen to soul and scream? Uh, high top. High top, the made up, knee deep in nostalgia and miles above any scientifically proven memories, you initiate contact, king's pawn opening. I can almost see your breath. You can almost touch my words here, high up in the beyond, waiting for the world next moves. So this painting, when I was making this painting, I was thinking about um, how it's really personal to just sit down and talk with one person, like over coffee or over dinner, just one other person, and how well you get to know another person when you just sit down and talk to them, and how maybe a lot more things would be better if this is a habit, the world just sitting down and listening to what other people have to say. Um, so that was, it's about that, and it's also about, you know, um, history, and if you could pick any person that you could sit down and have a conversation with at any point in time, in any point in history, who would that person be, and what questions would you have for them? Um, so that's kind of why I have this uh, table elevated into the sky, um, like that, so. And then you'll see I have different chairs, and and um, sort of a building, so I'm trying to seem like this table is high above everything else. Maybe this one you want to talk about first, which is right over there. Um, so I called this one Arc. I was interested in doing more of like water like working with water more in my paintings um, because typically I do more buildings, cityscapes. Um, so I just like, I <laughs> I started this new technique where I actually bought a bunch of ketchup bottles and I filled them up with paint and then I drew on top of the waves. So all these like squiggly marks you're seeing, like that's all from me just drawing with the paint. Um, so a lot of, I like to kind of mess up my techniques and use different materials because I always think it makes the piece more interesting. So um, in this one, I use different types of techniques with paint. I'll also use different types of paint, different brushes. Um, some of my work, I'll use spray paint, markers, pencils. So it's really, you know, how creative can you get? And now I'm starting to get more into collage work. So I'm trying, always trying to think of like new ideas and new things to um, juxtapose in my paintings besides just imagery. So about that. And I was really trying to um, capture some of the precariousness, precariousness that appears in this painting. So this is called arc. 
ladders to below, above to, turn up the faucet to, weeping to, turn on the spigot to, here now to unleash the liquid to, water to weary to whiplash to, swirl in the iris of horizon to, witness the wet of windset to, hide in the eye of reject to, float in the drowning of hopeless to, breathe in the rattling of broken to, gasp with the mouth of ocean to, curl with the swish of sudden to, gulp with the whir of, of twisters to, swallow with the salt of senseless to, blur with the vision of serpents to, spew with the sputum of whales to, reek with the regurgitation of Jonah to, sink in the rise of remorse to, know with the blind eye of Noah to, soar on the dry sky with dove to, circle to the submersion of world to, flutter and hover, to dive and discover, to finally land. And there's a close up. And in her artist statement, she, she talks about, you know, is this a tsunami or is this, you know, is it something hopeless or hopeful? Okay, this painting we don't have with us because it's about how big do you say this is? It's on like a big canvas, maybe 20 feet by it's like a 15 wall. feet. It's really large. And she has it on like, um, well, she just moved to a smaller place, so now it's in our house. <laughs> but it's, it's not hanging up. I pulled it up carefully. And I, and I keep saying, I'm nervous about having this masterpiece in my house. Uh, but this is another piece where um, there is so much going on, and let me talk about that. And um, I would pick up on some of the images, and then I used a lot of her artist statement and her cow size and used that Cantoon form again to weave uh, her ideas, her artist statement throughout the poem. Talk about it before I move on. I should read this. Okay. Your move visualizes the conversation between artists and audience in which the audience first questions the artist as a reliable and trustworthy source. Rather than answering, the artist posts their own questions to the audience. Why would I lie to you? Or why would I tell you the truth? Each question solidifies the same answer because they summarize these questions. Why juxtapose words and diverse images without instructing the audience to look don't look up, down, here, there, where, nowhere. Don't look. Who is this painting really for? Just like answers, the audience can roll the dice and pick a card, but do they follow the artist's instructions before they enter this painting of a make-believe wonderland? Again, like questions, the artist tells her audience that it's their move now before time is up. So like my mother was saying, um, this is a huge painting. Um, I would say maybe 10 feet. Big, um, it's on a painted on a giant draw cloth. Um, so this was the first like big scale painting I did. Like you can see, my work tends to be larger, but I never did anything to this sort of scale before. Um, so there's a lot going on in this. Um, you'll see that I have a chess board, and I talked about how you know chess is like a different game every time you play. Um, I have different chess pieces on the left-hand side. Um, you'll see, I believe, a king and a pawn. And then if you look up, you'll see um, the queen of hearts. So I really like board games because it kind of goes with, you know, getting to know someone more like I talked about in my in high top. But also, like, it's just a different game every time you play. Um, so I made this giant painting. And the phrases that I used, I instruct you not to look at it. So <laughs> it's it's really like I made this huge painting with all these beautiful colors, and you can't you can't not notice it. It's huge. Um, but yet my painting, you'll see like at the top left here, I have don't look up, down, here, there, nowhere, where, nowhere, don't look. Um, and then I have over here under the sun or moon, whatever you want it to be, I have, why would I lie to you? Kind of going up this way. And then 
this says time, time is up. So um, I'm, I'm telling you not to look, but I made you a big pain. <laughs> and then I'm also telling you that I'm not going to lie to you. But do you trust me? Do you trust what I'm telling you? Because I told you not to look at this. So it's kind of like I'm contradicting myself a lot in this work. Um, and I think that's one of my favorite parts about it. Um, when my mom and I talked about this work, when she was um, writing her poem about it, um, the one thing I mentioned to her was that I took a lot of inspiration from Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland. Um, so this is really like my Wonderland piece. Anything can happen. We have like different characters at play. You know, I have the Queen of Hearts in there. I have different um, different elements. I have mountains. I have grass. Are you in the jungle? Are you in the city? You don't really know. Um, there's some dice over there around the Queen of Hearts. And then I have this um, this space just going back, back, back. Um, so it just really never really ends. And I'm not, not going to read this one because it's longer, but I wanted to show you some close-ups of it. And you can see more of the words here. And this one, I particular. this one is right behind the screen back there. Um, but this is a fun one to read, but I love the, the backstory of it. Um, from my part, you should know, you can see it kind of looks like a swirl, like water going down a drain almost, but there's also all these little E's kind of going around in a circle. And you got to tell the, the story about this one. <laughs> um, so this is probably one of my favorite stories about my pieces because I think, it, I think a lot of people understand when I explain it, they understand what the problem is. And so I made this piece when I was, I made this piece when, um, based on a job that I had in college. And I had like this part-time job where I was working as um, kind of like a floater for a daycare. Um, so just like help out for ratio purposes and stuff. And that's kind of how my like stepping stone into getting into like, you know, doing arts with kids and like different age groups that was like the first thing I started doing um so when I worked there it was this um it was outside of Rochester New York in this place called Victor which is like a really nice area like mansions you know the, the, the daycare was very very expensive um and it was it was like great it was huge they had like everything that you could ever imagine um you know they had different programs they had think like Spanish and like different. it was kind of too good to be true and so when I was there I began realizing that the structure they had was really not a good structure for a four-year-old child because they were trying to teach them it was too much like middle school like you know you have this amount of time to do it now you need to put it away now you need to go to this class now you need to go to this class and it felt like they weren't really allowed to be kids um they were forced to be adults like too early on and so one of this painting is about a certain situation i had there where i was just helping out and we were at a small table and i had a couple of kids with me and they must have been like maybe five or so and what we were doing is we were teaching them about the letter E. So I think my job was like to help practice the letter E. And then I guess the next table was they were talking about things that began with the letter E or something like that. So I was doing like one task with the letter E. And so we did the task. I showed them how to do it. You know, the time was like up. They were getting ready to change stations. And I was getting ready to get new kids. And one of the kids turned to me and said, and asked me a question. And she said, um, she said, how do you spell, spell narwhal? And I just thought that was, like, first of all, it was really random. I wasn't expecting it at all, but I thought it was a really brilliant question because not only did she know what that was, um, but she asked me how to spell it. And at that age, like, kids asked me how to spell something. I was like, you know, my, I was like, oh, this is so great, you know. And so I answered her, and a staff member overheard me. 
and got mad at me and the child for that. So the whole purpose of this painting is why, why wasn't she allowed to ask that question? Why are we shutting down questions? This is a school, you know? You should be encouraging questions, not discouraging them. So um, this painting is called the letter E. <laughs> and this is in the form of a villanelle, so you have the entire lines repeated and then again in the, the last quatrain. The letter E. Don't distract me with questions. Those extraneous detours that topple learning. E and only E is today's lesson. The enemy of schedules is curiosity. A mission's necessary for well-paced delivery. We yearn for no distractions. Don't ask me questions. Time-wasting, silly digressions of how and why. Pay attention. Our concern is E and only E. Today's lesson is letter five. Your inquisitive obsessions are enemies of order. Don't ruin class by distracting me with questions. Creativity's the one transgression I won't allow. Sit still, don't squirm. E and only E is today's lesson. Up next, the letter F, natural progression of learning. Quiet. It's not your turn to talk. Don't distract me with questions. E and only E is today's lesson. So that, that, that's a lot of fun. That one was a lot of fun. And here are some close ups. I think I'll have you. Maybe you'll talk about the paintings first. Yeah, so um, these two I was kind of interested in doing a diptych. Um, so I started out, I believe I did the, this one first, which is um, AM and then PM I did next. And I was just interested uh, in um, like showing, conveying the morning and the night in a different way. Um, and so if you look back there, they're actually hanging up next to each other by the window. So yeah, I, I encourage you to like go up after this and just look a little closer for each of the paintings because there's a lot more that you notice when you look at it in person versus, you know, up here. But um, yeah, so this is just a diptych I did. And you'll, you can also see like I still have the sidewalks and cityscapes. So, and in some of my other paintings, you might have noticed ladders as well. So I think black, like as an arc over here, you'll see some ladders. But um, sidewalks and ladders both lead us to different places. Um, so you don't exactly know where that place is. So that's another just component to, to my theme. Antimeridium, post-meridium. Between anti and post, the self's permission slip to tarry. Invite the sun in for tea and toast, spread with lazy, while the mind wanders between in and out, mirroring the weather of wonder. Stay a while and admire. And then we're just going to do one more poem and uh, one more pairing. We started with the armchair at the beginning of the book and we end the book with the armchair as well and um, I think one of the things that Annalie and I really share is this idea that sometimes to be productive and to be creative and maybe you share this all as well you need to rest right you need that time to calm down maybe to be by yourself to, in order your brain to work and to go other places um, so maybe I will read this as well and then have you talk about the painting and then we'll end with this. This one's also a little bit longer. So this is a sestina and with a sestina, um, I don't always write in form, but for some reason I think working with these paintings really um, led me to that. With a sestina, you use the same six words over and over again in a set pattern. And then in the last stanza, 
which is a terse and a three-line uh, stanza, you have to use all six of the words. So it's kind of a puzzle. So I've got, you can look for these words, rest, chair, wild, wander, relax, and wind. And you can use them slightly different forms throughout. Wild rest. What does it mean to rest this lazy afternoon in an overstuffed chair, gazing out at a world so wild with wonder, the mind cannot help but wander out amidst the trees, relax in the hammock of wind. In this cushioned space, imagination rewinds the mind with quiet, calls in the calm. The rest of the house yawns while you stretch out, relax into the imprint of self in the tattered chair before the familiar view. A wonder, really, the paradox of renewal, its wild witness of a world gone wild with vision, passive breeze become wind, whipping into adventure to wonder the rugged terrain of contemplation. <clears throat> Likewise, rest is a carnival tour of the spontaneous. Strap in, this chair's roller coaster ride begins with relaxation, while the brain unbuckles boundaries. Relax and the mind climbs high, breathe and far below, wild whack-a-moles pop in and out of fields, from a simple chair, well-worn with inspiration, the valley's wind carries you both to and beyond the now. The rest is the miracle of repose. The way goes leads to wonder, and wonder, fun house of minds museum. Wonder the labyrinth of spirit, inhale, exhale, relax, breathing in the scent of the divine, each blessed rest of Sabbath. Creation's electric chariot ride to the wild begins with, be still and know, all paths winding back to this room and its well-worn chair. So count to 10, sing childhood's ABC in the same chair where your mother rocked you into a world of wonder, where you first learned that breath and wind are cousins, reciting rituals of relaxation in a world steeped in chaos. Embrace the wild and calm, the journey in rest. Here in this chair, the origins of wonder. Here, the rhythm of wind, breathing relaxation, daily recreated in your own wild, wild rest. So, um, this painting, you'll see that I have a road in there. It kind of relates to the the sidewalk and the ladders that I talked about before is taking you somewhere. Um, this painting is really about how when you're an artist, it's kind of similar to some on South Street that I did. You need some ways to make yourself. You need to think about your work. Um, I had a professor in college who was really my biggest mentor. And one of the things that really stuck with me is that he told me, art is more about seeing than it is about doing. And it took me a long time to really realize what he was saying, but he also told me to bring my paintings to my house so I could just look at them. And I cannot tell you how much more work I got done when I followed his advice, because instead of just thinking about it when I was at the studio, I was thinking about it constantly. I was always thinking about art. And even when you, you don't, it's like a lot of the time I didn't even realize I was thinking it was all like subconscious. So like I would come into my house and maybe I'd have a painting propped up on the wall and I passed it 10 times. And then one day I would look at it and something new would just like come into my head. But if that painting was sitting in my studio, would I pass it as often? Would I look at it as much? And the answer is no. So did it get done as quickly? Also, no. <laughs> so when I when you start bringing your art into your home, and then you, you know you can also have a studio as well. But I really think it's important to bring some pieces home with you, so that you're constantly seeing them, constantly thinking about your artwork and how you can improve. Um, and a lot of the things, you know, there are pieces that I made in like high school, and they sat in my parents' house for ten years. And then one day, not much longer. <laughs> and then one day, it just, it just came to me, 
you know? Like there was um, one painting that I made where I had, in high school, cut up a bunch of phone books and um, pasted it like a collage. And after that, I was like, I don't know what else to do with this. I was, I was just stuck. And it stayed there for over 10 years. And then I took it back, I think the other year, the other year and I had painted over it some buildings and I put a telephone pole. After I did that telephone pole, I was like, oh my goodness. I did telephone books. Like that didn't register in my head, but it was all subconscious. It was, it, it came out before I even realized what I was doing. I made a telephone pole on top of a telephone book and I didn't even realize what I was doing. So sometimes that just happens, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting, but so yeah, this painting is really about looking and, and thinking about art and, and sometimes you, oftentimes you think more than you paint. Um, so I just thought that was interesting. And, and to me that really describes a lot of writing as well. I think it's a very similar kind of process. And every time we, we do this together, I hear new stories, which is also really exciting to me. Like, I don't remember hearing that one before, so. Um, and then I just, I think, I just have a, you can see the ending of the poem there with the, the terse in more importantly. Uh, kind of a close up of some of the, the words and the letters going on in the painting as well. Okay, George, I think that's the end of this. Well, first, of all, first of all, thank you. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Um, let, me, let me open it up to questions for everybody else first. Questions, comments? Please. <laughs> Smart ass remarks. <laughs> well. I'm really glad that you blew up the paintings. To get the detail. Yeah. The first thing I thought of when I saw the paintings on the screen was it's almost like a Van Gogh. Like I, I saw Van Goghs uh -huh. over and over and over again. I'm like, what's so special about these Van Goghs? And then I went to a museum and I looked at a Van Gogh and I was like, oh my God, that's my <laughs> that's what it's all about. Van Gogh immersive. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it's uh, yeah, yeah. the three dimensional yeah. portion of it. So thank you for blowing it up and really will make me walk up to them. Yeah, because there's so many different layers to it. Yeah. Annalise, do you always agree with what your mother writes? Or <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had somebody else ask me that. I don't know, we just had a Zoom read a couple weeks ago, and somebody else asked me the same question. I was like, you know, you guys hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. I, I was like, you know what? I think she really nailed it. <laughs> um, and there was like, a, she took a lot from my artist statements because I usually write like a little bit of a statement about each piece, which is posted on, on these. So when you walk around, you'll be able to see a little bit more of what the piece is about. Um, uh, did I do it right? Uh, <laughs> yeah, <she did> it. <laughs> um, so like, yeah, she took a lot of inspiration from my artist statements. And then occasionally she like text me and be like, is this what you meant? And I was like, yes. Um, I think the most she asked me about, the most input I gave was the really big one, your mood. And I think what I told you is it, I was really inspired by Alice in Wonderland. And she took that and added more to the poem with that. But for the most part, you know, I think the artist statements covered it when I sent those to her. And we had maybe a couple conversations about each one where she kind of checked in. Was this, she wanted to make sure she was getting the gist of my painting. Um, and I think she did. <laughs> she did a great job. Yeah, and I, 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 it did really help to have the artist statements, especially with the more abstract pieces. Like, uh, you know, the letter E, I would not have written that particular story or that particular interpretation if I didn't know that story, even though some of it was in the artist statement. Um, and it did really help. I felt like I had like a couple different types of conversations because I had the written conversation of Annalise's artist statement, which helped me get started. And then I would send these to her and, um, you know, is this on the money? Am I capturing what you were saying? Or I don't want to be contradicting what you're trying to say. Even though, like, with the ones like the noise, you would see some of the stuff I was going through myself would seep into the poem. Um, but it also, I think 
the intercepted, you know, what she was trying to say versus what I was experiencing at the time. Emily, do you ever um, do a painting from your mother's poetry? Yes, actually, that one. Um, the large, it's called Sound in the middle there. Mm -hmm. That is actually based on one of my mother's poems. So um, that's funny that you ask. <laughs> so I did that one. That was the first one. I, out of any of these, I think that was the first one I did. And it's actually my favorite piece that I've ever made. So I'm glad that you guys all get to okay. experience What's it. What's the subject of the original poem? You know? it, it's from a poem called The Lines in Your Body, which might make my husband blush. <laughs> But uh, the lines that she took from it, I think oh, it was a, on an assignment. The, on the back porch. Yeah. Your the, steps. Your, um, yeah. If you want to just point it out there. Let's see it back it's on the, the background on the right uh, side. This is your breath left behind on the back porch, your steps clicking. So she just took a line from it. And um, it's actually, oh no, it's not, it's not from that poem. It's from a poem called This is the Color. Uh, which is a poem that I often use in my class um, as a, an exercise to get students to discuss, to describe a specific kind of color. And uh, I have them write down colors on a piece of paper and then pass it around to something unusual colors, like, you know, can't be like red, orange, like ebony or um, okra or something like that, very specific. And then they have to write a whole poem describing that color. And the poem is called This is the Color. So I think you had, um, uh -oh. <laughs> I had um, some sort of college assignment. Yeah, where she's supposed to write about a poem or something. So oh, I want to put it. <laughs> 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 so find something, so. Yeah, and I picked that poem because I like the specific, some of the specific phrases she had in there. I thought they would look nice. They were just, they flowed nicely. So I wanted to. And how did your collaboration start? What? So it's it started with my mother showing her students my website, um, and she had them write poems based on my website. So after that happened, she was kind of like, "Why don't we? Why don't I write poems about your work?" And I was like, "That's a good idea." <laughs> so that's kind of where it started. Yeah, and so I had given the students a bunch of different <laughs> ecrastic prompts, and I'd given them several different web pages, and so many of them were really intrigued with Annalise's work. Um, and so it was really pretty cool that ecrastic review took three of my students' works, and then I wrote some poems to go with it, and then they showed Annalise's poem. So, uh, so it was. You know, not only was Anna Lee there, but my students were there, and I, we were all like there on the same page together. Um, and I, I knew that the editor had written a, a blurb for another one of my books, Florette, so um, I think she was really excited about supporting this kind of collaboration. These are great questions. I'll, I'll I'll throw a couple of things out and maybe other people chime in too. Um, I can read my own pen. An orange pen for some reason, I check. I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> always bring a notebook. Um, so the, the first thing that jumps out, and I, I remember this jumping out of me when I read the book too, is this idea that you wanted to confuse people. And the thing that we get teaching poetry a lot, I'm sure, you can get this, it's like, People are afraid of it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's so, I don't know what it means. What is it supposed to mean? It's so confusing. So it's intriguing to me that you want to confuse people. And, and the poet Tony Hoagland has a big essay about po poems that orient you and disorient you. They start you out in the middle of like, where the hell am I? And then some poems are very careful to place you. What is it about confusion that you like? Uh, and is it the same as disorientation? I would say similar, but not the same. Um, so I I really like surrealism. 
Like if I had to define a way that I paint, I would say I'm an abstract surrealist. I don't know if that's actually a term, but I'm pretty sure I just made it up. <laughs> um, but that's, you know, I, I think when you look at a lot of work like, um, you know, you go like Salvador Dali and you really pay attention to his work, he has a lot of very confusing things in his work. Things that just don't make any sense. Things that are not possible on this world. And so as one of like the most inspiring artists to me, I wanted to kind of go with that dreamlike state. So it's not real, it's confusing, but it's almost like you're dreaming too. Um, so I think the, the theme of confusion really opens a whole new door to different possibilities because I'm not constricting you in any way and telling you this painting is about um, one thing. I'm saying it could be about this or it could be about something else. It's really up to you. And a lot of the times, like I talked about before, people will give me new ideas, things that I don't even think my piece is about. And then I'm like, oh my goodness, I can really see that. Like the, the girl I told you about with the train, so it can add like a whole new, I guess, meaning. It adds more meaning onto things when I don't specifically tell you. It's almost like when you know when you're watching a movie, the story is better when it's left up to your own interpretation than when the actor comes out and says, "Oh, I did this. I did this this way." You know what I mean? Um, so I think it makes better makes better story, makes better artwork um, when you include the audience in that process. That uh, illegitimately trained, and looking at it in a certain way, it actually sort of, to me, looked like a sleeping <clears throat> face oh. with a mask on. <clears throat> uh -huh. um, those eyebrows. Yeah, I hear, I hear different things every time. Yeah. Yeah, that's, and that's what I like about doing this. It, it, it's, it makes me want to say something to you that I, I guess I'll never get so you think a lot about the subconscious. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. I'm really into late psychology too and how how you think and I just think that's really interesting. So that comes out a lot of my work. Um we talked about sprawls for a minute. Squirrel, squirrel, squirrel. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> squirrels. I don't know what call them squirrels. Um, were you attracted to that shape before you started painting, or is it something that just kind of came out? I think it really came out in, and you mentioned Van Gogh earlier, um, but I'm a really big Van Gogh fan, and he has kind of all these like swooping um, colors. And I guess that was just something that subconsciously started to come out in my work because I was a big fan of Van Gogh. And so I look at all his paintings and then I would paint and it didn't start off like this. The first time I tried to make something abstract, it was a complete disaster. It did not work out. Um, and I, the best way to describe it is being an abstract artist is the same as being a landscape painter. You just use different representation. You use all, everything else is the same. You have a foreground, middle ground, background. You use bigger, br bigger brush strokes in, in the foreground to make it seem closer. You use smaller brush strokes in the back to push the web. You thin the paint out more in the background. That's the same stuff landscape painters are doing. It's just my, my work is non-representational. Um, so when I tell people that, that sometimes they're like, they, they didn't think of that before, but that's how I learned how to paint like this. It's, I learned how to do realistic, realistic stuff first, and then I did abstract. It's very hard to do abstract first and then go realistic. Mm -hmm. well, so challenge you a little bit on this. I, I think that we all poets have a ground. And that's why, that's why to me poetry and painting are very, very closely related, especially in the way that you use title. But the, there, there are certain elements of the vocabulary that keep coming back. You mentioned roads, chairs. You know, and we have these same tendencies as poets. We tend to use certain images over and over again, or, or mm -hmm. even phrasing, certain kind of sentences. 
Um, are you very conscious of that? It seems like you are. I am, you. and I wasn't at first. Um, a lot of the things I would do would be subconscious, and then I would look at my work, and I'd critique my work in college, which was a big like, eye-opener to what I was doing. And when I had my sophomore review, we had, basically, I had to hang up a bunch of paintings, and that's when they decided to, to admit you into a specific program in, of your choosing. I was already an art major, but it was more like getting into the specialty of painting or if you want to do graphic design. <laughs> so you had to like apply, it was like applying twice, kind of. So my sophomore review, I hung a bunch of paintings up and my professors came up and they didn't ask me about my paintings, they asked me, what do you read and what do you think about? And then they said, what kind of movies do you watch? What kind of TV shows do you watch? And I just, I, I remember that because at the time I was like, you see all my artwork I just spent all this time on? You're talking to me about movies and stuff? Like, um, but they were trying to understand what I what was going on in my head so that they could help me convey that on the canvas in a better way. And I told them, I'm like, I really like movies that make you think. I like um, I like stories that can have different meanings. And you'll see a lot of what I said really did come out in my artwork. So I would just say that there's, there's certain themes that I'm drawn to um, that I really like, and um, I read about them, I write about them, um, and those same surrealistic themes bounce over into a visual medium as well. Marjorie, related to this, is your use of certain forms. You chose um, several forms which are kind of accepted as contemplative forms because of the repetition, the use of the brain. Uh, the pantoon, but especially the sestet, and especially the villanelle, where the lines keep coming back and asking you to think about them in a different way. Um, you don't, do you write a lot of that kind of stuff otherwise? I didn't used to. Yeah. Uh, I've been writing a lot more formalist poems lately, but I think one of the reasons that I wrote about them more um, when I was writing about Annalie's work was because I started out using those phrases from her artist statement. And so it seemed natural to kind of keep coming back to them and to weave them in. And so things like the Pentoum and the Villanelle um, seemed very appropriate to kind of get. And because um, so much of her work is about looking at things from different perspectives, using the same phrases, but then meaning something slightly different, you know, the Villanelle particularly, you're using the same phrase or close to the same phrase, but it's kind of in a different context, so it doesn't mean exactly the same thing. So I was really in, yeah, interested in that as well. And God bless yeah. you for writing this, Estina, because they can <laughs> really, really yeah, I, I like, tired to write. Yeah, yeah I like Sestina. I mean, yeah. uh, I've been writing more in form, in form when I get blocked, because it actually opens things, the, the structure opens things mm -hmm. up. You know, it gives you kind of an outline, and it does lead you to places that you, kind of like what you were saying with your artwork, um, leads you to places that you weren't expecting to go, but you know that the next word has to be this, you know, at the end of the line. So. Yeah, maybe just pause the last question and then go back to the audience okay. for any concerns. Um, you mentioned artists kind of, this can't go back to yeah, illegitimately trained. Art is kind of like a, like how could you do that for a living? It's a, lux it's a luxury, right? It's kind of like a luxury, you know? Not everybody needs it. I, what's, there's a or lot a of hobby, that, you know? Before I came yeah. here, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's sort of like, a, it's, it's a luxury, and right now there's a lot of talk about utilitarianism and education, and you know, there's a lot of controversy that we do higher education. Um, do you see art as a luxury? Or, or necessity. Well, what's that famous quote about, you know, coming to find the news in poetry by, I think, uh, um, I, I yeah. can't remember exactly, but it's, it, it, you know, the idea that if we didn't have poetry, how would we find out what the news was and what was going on in the world? Because this is what life is about. This is how you capture it. You find out what's happening day to day by day in people's real lives. And you find it in poetry and in art. You know that's what captures how you see the world, um, how you see each other, how the 
the world sees you, you know, the back and forth, that interaction. I as forgot what the question was. Ezra Pound yeah, is the news that stays. Oh, yeah. the news that yeah. stays news, yeah. Um, but do you, what about you, Ron? Did you, did you think about what you do as kind of things people need or things people want? I think it's something you need. I think it gives you a different perspective on things. Um, and it does something for your mind. Um, the right art will make you think about yourself. Um, and I just think that's really important. I don't think it's so necessarily a want. I think it's something we need. It's part of the human experience is writing and creating things. And if we don't create, then you know, it's like a giving back to society almost. I think it's it, it's important to me. It's, it's what I'll do for the rest of my life. Um, so I really think I have this calling to show people artwork. Oh, this is a much better answer. It's almost like a, I guess when I was in art school, my professor said, like, an itch. You got it. You just yeah. have to do it. If you don't paint, if I don't paint for a long, like, weeks, I don't feel like myself. You know, I just, it's who I, it's part of who I am at this point. Yeah, we, we, you guys were talking about pranks over lunch, and I, I always think a lot of people need to pay, play pranks on each other, and I think because they just kind of need to. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I mentioned to you yeah. that the quote we're having here in November on um, this call, so I asked him, like, aren't you afraid, like, he's writing a screenplay now, and I'm like, aren't you afraid that you're in a field of writing that's going to become obsolete like, really, really soon? And he said, if you totally destroy all the writing tomorrow, the next day, people will start writing again. So I guess that's the itch. Yeah. That's the thing. It's the way I think. It's the way I process yeah. things. Yeah. Unless AI starts to do all the <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. AI can go wrong. <laughs> um, anybody else? Questions? Thank you, folks. Well, thank and you I, so I, much. I, 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 I,